As we know, Hitler invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939. Poland's ally, Britain, asked Germany to back out of Poland, which she doesn't do. So, on the 3rd of September, Britain declared war on Germany. And Hitler is actually shocked by this. He angrily turned to Ribbentrop and asked, what now? That's a good question, Hitler. What's also a good question is, why did you start the war? And there's a massive debate surrounding this, which I've already waded into before. A while back, I did a video called The Real Reason Why Hitler Had to Start World War II. Currently, it's my second most popular video ever. There was a problem with that video, though. As you saw at the beginning of this video, I put references at the bottom of the screen to back up what I was saying. I came up with the idea to do this a couple of years ago, and I think I'm still the only person on YouTube doing it. And the reason why I do this is because people used to claim that I was just making stuff up. I wasn't. I always listed my bibliography in my older videos, but a lot of viewers didn't notice that and proceeded to dismiss everything I was saying because supposedly it wasn't backed up. They can't claim that anymore though because I back up everything I say with references in the video. But unfortunately, my The Real Reason Why Hitler Had to Start World War II video was one of the last videos I made prior to me coming up with the idea of the reference bar. It was only three months after that video that I made my first video with the reference bar, the public versus private video. This is one of the reasons why the Real Reason video got a lot of downvotes. It's a controversial topic, and there's no references in the video itself even though there is an extensive bibliography. The point is that not only is there a huge debate about why Hitler started the war, and not only are people doubting the traditional narratives relating to that, but they're also doubting my narrative, at least partly because I didn't back it up with direct references, plus other reasons too. They also aren't the type of people to watch my five-hour Hitler socialism video, which explain this, again, backed by copious amounts of sources, and the reference bar. And the reason why is because some people would rather remain plugged into the Matrix than see the world as it really is. Take the red pill, Neo. Well, one of my patrons, and he's not the only one, can't get his head around the reason why Hitler started the Second World War. He doubts all the narratives, and he's also dismissing some of the sources, believing them to be nothing other than electoral propaganda. I know it's a long question, but I've seen a lot of people saying the same sort of thing in the comments of my videos, and so I'm going to read it in full so you not only get the context, but also see why people are thinking like this. He also explains why some of the narratives surrounding this question don't make sense to him. So here's the question. Hi Tick, coming back with my second question as promised in my early message, why did Hitler start World War II? He knew Britain would declare war on Germany if he stepped into Poland. By that point, he had already greatly breached all the treaties and greatly expanded Germany's territory, including Czechoslovakia, and got away with it. Why would anyone start a war with the British Empire, jeopardising all the gains he had got away with, plus all of Germany, to be honest, in a war with Britain over the city of Danzig. Even if the Poles did mistreat the German population in Danzig, you'd imagine it's not quite worth starting a war with the British Empire over this matter. He seemed to establish decent relations with England in 1938 and basically secured his getting away with his breaches by signing the Munich Agreement. Is he really not smart enough to just take that win? Why ruin everything over Danzig? I have heard many explanations and various versions of an actual reason Hitler started World War II, but none of these managed to make sense in my mind. I cannot put myself in Hitler's shoes under any version and think that, yes, it is worth it to wage war versus Britain for this, insert reason that makes sense here, whilst having a virtually infantile war economy, which is close to zero compared to Britain and her allies. I cannot find that reason at all. The version of the Poles tormenting the German population in Danzig does not make sense. The Lebensraum version, written in Mein Kampf, does not make sense for me, as I don't see Mein Kampf as having any value whatsoever in terms of seeking the truth as it pertains to Hitler's truth, or the historical truth, as it was collectively written a longer time ago, back in the time when Hitler was trying to come up with all sorts of work to persuade the electorate to vote for him, by a group of people including 
including Rudolf Hess and Hitler, who co-wrote certain parts of it. Mein Kampf was just an electoral long-shot piece of work in my personal opinion. Anyway, closing the Mein Kampf bracket here and back on topic, would love to hear what you think what really happened that made Hitler knowingly start World War II without a solid war economy and, except Italy, without allies anywhere close to it. I am really hoping your version will make sense for me. There is something fishy there and I can't decipher it. Thank you very much, Tick. Well, Blackjack Swagger replied to you saying that Hitler was gambling and thought England was bluffing with their opposition of his territorial gains. He then also gives the quote about Hitler asking Ribbentrop, now what, with that I quoted at the beginning of the video. Mr. Musk then replied, Britain has made it clear well in advance that they would declare war on Germany if they attacked Poland. I don't get why Hitler would be shocked and ask Ribbentrop, now what? This sounds too dumb to be true. Also, a small nuance is this. After Hitler did invade Poland, if you listen to Chamberlain's war declaration, even after that final hour, there were attempts by the British to communicate with the Germans to avoid the war, to no avail as the Germans wouldn't collaborate. I don't get, for the life of me, why Hitler would take such a huge gamble, jeopardising all his illegal gains to date, just because the Polish mistreated the German community in Poland and it became too unbearable. It does not make sense to me. The only explanation that I found semi-plausible is that Hitler's and Schacht's economic measures actually made it necessary for Hitler to wage war for territorial gains in order for the economy to survive. The reasons I find this semi-plausible and not entirely plausible is because I am not an economist and I obviously do not know the insides of the economy of the Third Reich and whether Germany would have gone into massive recession economic collapse had Hitler made no territorial conquests at all. Think about it. By 1938, Hitler got away with so many territorial conquests and illegal Versailles treaty breaches, including expanding the German army 80-fold beyond the allowed limit, creating Luftwaffe, etc. He signed the Munich Agreement with Britain and other countries, which was a huge diplomatic victory for Hitler. He should have stopped there. If you read his speeches in early 1939, he is very satisfied with the way 1938 had gone in terms of his accomplishments. Why the change of mind? Why blow it all because of the Poles mistreating Germans in Poland? Unless he was very mentally ill, although he seems impressively knowledgeable in many regards, or he was very misinformed by Abwehr and Canaris, which I have heard from a couple of historians. Even Alfred Jodl, in his last statement at Nuremberg, said, Our intelligence system was working partly for the enemy. Personally, I do think he trusted his corrupt intelligence, which was downsizing and underestimating any potential enemy of Germany from Britain to Russia, and by listening to false reports day after day, he got seduced and dragged into this war, which, to be frank, once entered, he had no chance of winning, especially after attacking Russia and failing to capture and hold the Caucasus oil. So obviously there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to do a video on Canaris and the Abwehr, in answer to another patron question, so I'll leave that part for now. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not already, so you get notified when that goes out. But what I find interesting is that you're dismissing sources like Mein Kampf and haven't looked into the economic side, but are also saying it doesn't make sense. Well, the first issue here is that by just sticking to tanks or military history, you're not going to figure this question out because the answer to the question doesn't lie in the military history. This is why I'm not just sticking to tanks, because you can't. Old historians did this due to ideological reasons, and that's why the Madman Hitler myth and the idea that his German generals were the greatest Aryan Super Saiyans that have ever existed came into being. You can't miss half the equation out and then complain that the answer doesn't make any sense. Two doesn't equal four, but the answer is four. So you just missed the first half of the equation out. And the reason you did that was because you let your personal opinion override your rational brain. Don't do that. Once you've got the evidence, then you can give your personal opinion, not the other way around. History is the study of the human condition. It requires evidence, then interpretation. You're trying to interpret without the evidence, which is belief, and you're doing that because you're letting your belief, your personal opinion, your emotions, 
dictate whether you think a source is worthy of your attention or not. You need to stop that. Mein Kampf is a very valuable historical source. Yes, the worldview that's presented in it is wrong, and in that sense it should be dismissed. I'm not saying anyone should agree with it and be a Nazi, quite the opposite. What I'm saying is that, with a couple of exceptions, Mein Kampf is genuinely what Hitler believed, and it's how he saw the world. That's not how the world is. His belief is totally wrong, but it is the way that Hitler saw it. So, if you dismiss Mein Kampf, you're dismissing the way that Hitler saw the world. And for that reason, you shouldn't dismiss it. There are times in Mein Kampf where Hitler did lie. For example, he lied when he said he was a Christian. I've had Christian Nazis on the channel arguing that Hitler was a Christian, and I've also had people who hate the Catholic Church in the comments saying how Hitler was a pawn of the Catholic Church. Well, apart from the fact that Hitler's socialism flies in the face of Christian teachings, we have plenty of other evidence of Hitler hating the Catholic Church and Christians. See the references below, and yes, Hitler wasn't a Christian. There's also a couple of other questionable parts of Mein Kampf, but the point is that the majority of it is genuinely the way that Hitler sees the world. So why, according to Hitler, did he start the war? Well, he believed that international Jewish finance was causing the class crisis that international Jewish Marxism was using to seize control of the world. And since communism destroys the idea of the race and makes everyone equal, apparently, this would allow the Jews to breed with the Aryans, which would dilute the blood. And since Hitler says only Aryans can create nations, this would bring about the collapse of civilization. In addition, Hitler believed, just like all socialists believe, that capitalism was dying. Due to the socialist idea that the markets were shrinking, and thus would eventually lead to starvation, he said that they had a limited time to solve the problem before it became too late. In his second book, he says, they had less than 30 years before people in Europe will groan under the consequences of the shrinking markets problem. His plan to solve this crisis was to go east, seize the resources that he needed to implement socialism for the Germans, which would prevent the Jews from implementing their fiendish plot. The trend of development which we are now experiencing would, if allowed to go unhampered, lead to the realisation of the pan-Jewish prophecy that the Jews will one day devour the other nations and become lords of the earth. For a fight it will have to be, since the first objective will not be to build up the idea of the people's state, but rather to wipe out the Jewish state which is now in existence. As so often happens in the course of history, the main difficulty is not to establish a new order of things, but to clear the ground for its establishment. So, in a nutshell, Hitler's overall plan was to stop the Jews by implementing socialism, but he couldn't do that until he had taken the resources of the East. So he implemented a limited socialism, built up the army, and went East. That was his ideological reasoning. And again, if you ignore the ideology, you're left with nothing. You're scratching your head because you've ignored what Hitler said. None of what I said before is true, by the way. The markets aren't shrinking. The Aryans aren't the only ones who can create nations. And the blood doesn't get diluted. And it's been more than 30 years since Hitler wrote that everyone would be suffering under the shrinking markets problem. And we're not. So I don't believe in anything that Hitler said. But I do believe that Hitler believed in those things. So, and this, and this is the distinction. Don't believe in what he said, but understand what he believed. So now we understand what Hitler believed, and we can see why he thought it necessary to go east. But here's the next problem. Musk said he hadn't looked into the economics. Well, this is the next piece of the puzzle, so we can't ignore it anymore. Now, I understand why people may not have looked into the economics, because I think people imagine economics to be 
all about maths and a subject that has no real substance. No, we call that Keynesianism. Actual economics is very easy to understand, isn't about maths really, and does have substance. And it certainly isn't complicated, it's actually really interesting. And when it comes to the question, why Hitler started the Second World War, the economics is a critical component. The old historians dismissed the economy of the Third Reich because of their ideological agenda. It's only recently that historians have seriously started to dabble in the economic side of the Third Reich, and that's why there's only a few books on the topic. And a lot of the books that have been written on the topic are trying their hardest to remind us how much of a free market the totalitarian, centrally planned economy of the Third Reich actually was, because of their ideological agenda. Well, historians like Gotts Alley and Rainer Zeitelman and others besides have started coming out and saying no. In the book Hitler's Beneficiaries, a fantastic book, highly recommended, Ali explains why Hitler had to start the war when he did. Upon taking power, Hitler decided to borrow currency to pay for his so-called economic recovery, which really wasn't a recovery nor a miracle. Anyway, the way that borrowing currency works is that you consume more today and less tomorrow. Let's say my income is £1 a day, and I spend all of it today. Great. But then, the next day, I decide that £1 isn't enough, and I really want this guitar plectrum that costs £2. Talk about a rip-off. So, I take out a £1 loan from the bank at 10% interest. I spend the £2 today buying the plectrum that I then lose somewhere down the back of my chair, but all is good because... I get to spend all this extra money today, right? No, because the day after I have to pay the interest on the loan. So instead of having £1 to spend, as before, I now have to give 10 pence to the bank, and I'm left with just 90 pence to spend from now on. And that's just to pay the interest on the loan. To eventually pay the loan back, I'd have to pay more than 10 pence to the bank, otherwise, I'll never pay more than the interest back, and I'll be paying the interest to the bank forever. So yes, on the first day I took out the loan, I spent double my income. But from then onwards, I had to reduce my income to pay back the interest on the loan. The point being that I overconsumed one day and had to pay for that overconsumption in the future by underconsuming later. Well, this same principle applied to the Third Reich. In the first couple of years, Hitler could get away with spending almost 300% more currency than the state was earning, increasing the public state debt by 10.3 billion Reichsmarks. Despite increasing the corporate tax rate from 20 to 40%, taking over two countries, stealing off the Jews, and doing other despicable things, Public state debt reached 37.4 billion Reichsmarks by the August of 1939. In 1939, the Reich was spending 3.3 billion of its roughly 17.5 billion Reichsmark income just paying the interest on the loans, and it was spending 20.5 billion on its military alone, plus another 16.3 billion on social programs for its civilian population. Effectively, German state finances were a shambles, and the only way to get out of this was to go to war and steal off the Jews. Hitler bridged what he and his leadership knew to be a precarious financial situation with military adventures that had terrible consequences for millions of people. Dispossession, deportation, and mass murder became major sources of state income. In 1942, Deputy Finance Minister Reinhardt issued a blanket order. The contributions that have been allocated to paying off the interest and principal on the national debt must henceforth be covered by current revenues earned from the economic exploitation of the Eastern Territories. The Nazi regime required the constant military destabilization of the periphery, in other words, all the countries that had been conquered, in order to maintain the illusion of financial stability at the center of the Reich. There will be people complaining about this in the comments below. Why? Well, first, many Nazis are anti-Jewish because they believe that the Jews are what Karl Marx called 
the money changers. According to the Nazis, the Jews are the ones running the so-called private, actually public, central banks, who are printing currency and stealing off of everyone through the poverty-inducing stealth tax that nobody seems to understand, called inflation. Inflation is defined as the inflation, or expansion, of the currency supply. Note, I refuse to use the elitist newspeak definition of the word inflation, which they claim is rising prices. No, something that rises is not an inflation. When a plane takes off from the runway, it doesn't inflate. When an elevator goes up in its shaft, it doesn't inflate. When you go up a flight of stairs, you don't inflate. Something that rises is not an inflation. Only the expansion of something is an inflation. Rising prices are one of the symptoms of inflation, and are an indication that the elite are silently stealing your wealth and redistributing it to themselves, supposedly for your benefit, but really only for theirs. Case in point, the Weimar Republic. Case in point, Venezuela where the bottom 90% have seen their living standards decrease, while the top 10% have seen their wealth increase massively as a result of inflation. If you want to know why the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, the word is inflation. I wonder why Lord Baron Keynes and his elitist cult followers are championing inflation. Is it because it benefits them, the elite, perhaps? So, the Nazis believed that Hitler battled against the Jewish money changers by breaking the debt-based economic model and refusing to inflate. They even say he went back on the gold standard. They say that this is why the world went after him, because the Jews didn't like that. Which is incorrect. Hitler did inflate his currency, he did print new notes and coins into existence, and he did engage in deficit spending. In many ways, it was proto-Keynesianism. Therefore, the modern Nazi narrative is completely false. The other reason people will disagree with this is because they're Keynesians, or Marxists. Either way, they'll claim that the Nazis didn't print currency because they were capitalists who stuck to the gold standard. Hitler didn't believe in the labour theory of value. I next argued that the gold standard, the fixing of rates of exchange and so forth, were shibboleths, which I had never regarded and never would regard as weighty and immutable principles of economy. Money, to me, was simply a token of exchange for work done, and its value depended absolutely on the value of the work accomplished. Where money did not represent services rendered, I insisted it had no value at all. So, anyway, by printing currency to finance extravagant social policies as well as military mobilisation, the Reich had to solve its deteriorating financial situation. On September 1st, 1938, Schwerin von Krosig informed the Führer that within the month, state coffers would run dry. With Germany's financial situation worsening by the day, the Nazi leadership in Berlin was keen to forge ahead with its annexation of Czechoslovakia and its domestic pogroms against Jews. The state treasury needed more money. Despite various accounting tricks, the government was just barely avoiding bankruptcy. If nothing was done, Germany's financial problems would quickly be laid bare. The only hope was to go on the offensive. Seizing Jewish property helped significantly, and I would argue that the financial crisis brought on by Hitler's socialism was a major impetus for the Holocaust. I know no other way to keep my four-year plan and the German economy going. But there was another way to solve the financial crisis. The Germans could seize foreign territories and shift responsibility for paying off Germany's debts to their new slaves. The way they did this was by seizing all the gold from the central banks in occupied countries, for example Poland's central bank, and then increase taxes on the foreign citizens. In addition, they printed foreign currency, including Reich credit bank notes which weren't accepted in Germany, and gave those currencies to their soldiers and civilian occupiers. These would purchase, or just steal, depending, all the goods off the shelves in the foreign countries, 
and either consume them or ship them back to the Reich. More goods flowing into the Reich would keep prices from rising too quickly, because even though there were more notes in circulation, there was more goods to buy those notes with. Thus, it would mask the effects of the central bank inflation policies. To keep things simple, they basically exported their inflation to other countries. This is why Greece's economy hyperinflated during the war, for example, which I covered in a previous video. It's also why the Reich's economy began to implode once they stopped conquering new territories and couldn't balance the financial situation anymore. Starting at least in 1943, but possibly earlier. A story for another day. So, the reason Hitler had to go to war was partly because he wanted to defeat the Jews, seize the land and resources of the East, and set up socialism in alignment with his ideology. And it was also because if he didn't go to war in September 1939, then the Reich's finances would have collapsed. By seizing Austria, Czechoslovakia, and finally Poland, Hitler effectively staved off a major internal crisis within the Reich and exported that crisis to the Czechs and Poles, and then many others later when he conquered their territories. So, for those reasons, Hitler had to go to war in September 1939. It's also why he couldn't just be satisfied with the territories he's already got, because if he didn't expand, he'd be facing that internal collapse, just like every other socialist country has previously. But, as Musk said, Hitler knew that Britain would declare war on him if he invaded Poland, right? So, why was he shocked when they did declare war? Well, this can be explained in one word. Chamberlain. Britain had already decided to give in when Hitler left the League of Nations. They did nothing when Hitler announced he was going to rearm in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. They did nothing when Hitler reoccupied the Rhineland. Then Chamberlain gave in when Hitler anschlussed Austria. Then, when Chamberlain was informed that a coup was in place to take Hitler out, and all that Chamberlain needed to do was stand firm over the Sudetenland and tell Hitler no, Chamberlain flew to Munich, bent over, and let Hitler perform a prostate exam. The plot had been meticulously prepared. The moment Hitler gave the order to invade the Sudetenland, they would make their move. But in all his careful preparations, Erwin von Witzleben had missed one crucial factor. The British Prime Minister. The British knew of the plot, and it's strongly suspected that the Prime Minister did too. In fact, it has been suggested that Chamberlain wanted his moment on the world stage, his 15 minutes of fame, and that's why he surrendered the Sudetenland to Germany. Chamberlain certainly became very popular back in Britain for having avoided war. Chamberlain dolls were made of the Prime Minister, as well as photographs that sold like hotcakes. But the agreement had humiliated the French, and was a historic debacle. On the 30th of September 1938, the Munich Agreement was signed, a historic moment rendered farcical when Hitler dipped his pen in the ornate inkwell, only to discover that it did not contain any ink. Then, shortly afterwards, Hitler upped his demands again, and sure enough, Chamberlain gave in again. And so, there was no order to invade, no launching of armies, and no trigger for a coup. It was over. The plotters could have justified the coup to the German people by saying that Hitler was provoking war, and that only a coup could have prevented war. But that justification no longer worked because Chamberlain had given in. And the reason Chamberlain gave in was because this was in alignment with Britain's traditional policy of dealing with Europe, which was to use alliances to break up any power block and keep possession of the sea. When the British, in 1914, had decided to intervene rather than sit out and play the balance of power game, this led to disaster. 723,000 British deaths in the First World War. So, Chamberlain didn't want to make that mistake again. The problem, of course, is that the traditional British policy didn't say, just give in whenever someone demands something. <laughs> it said, use alliances to prevent one side from getting too strong. Well, by giving in to Hitler, Chamberlain empowered him and made him stronger. 
and from a financial perspective, helped Hitler stay afloat. So what Chamberlain did was utterly ridiculous. But things started to change after the Munich Agreement. On the 8th of November 1938, the British were informed that the German government has secretly ordered a spontaneous wave of reprisals to be launched by paramilitaries against the Jews, under cover of which their private wealth will be pillaged and Jewish synagogues will be burnt. Fire engines will be pre-positioned around the synagogues, not to stop them burning, but to save neighbouring buildings. And so, on the night of November 9th, 1938, the German police, the SS Security Service and fire services stepped aside as the SA were unleashed upon the Jews. 7,500 Jewish-owned shops were smashed, Jews had their homes broken into and their properties socially expropriated, and over a thousand synagogues, or other Jewish places of worship, were torched. The only reason they didn't burn the Jewish shops is because Rudolf Hess was concerned that the fires may spread to nearby German shops. Hundreds of Jews were murdered, beaten, and 30,000 ended up in Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen. Even Jewish graves were dug up and their tombs were smashed. The Nazis themselves admitted that 91 Jews were killed, although it was certainly many times higher, probably into the thousands. Later, in Vienna alone, there were 680 suicides in the aftermath of the event, which became known as the Night of Broken Glass, or Kristallnacht. British and international opinion was appalled by Kristallnacht. Even pro-Germans reacted with revulsion. It destroyed America's faith in appeasement and shocked Chamberlain too, but it wasn't the only event. In December, Canaris warned Britain that Hitler intended to bomb London in March. Halifax reacted by putting an anti-aircraft battery at Wellington Barracks, which was visible from the German embassy, and the British government started building an anti-aircraft gun factory near Glasgow. And finally, Hitler invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia as the Slovakians declared independence. This was the final straw that broke the camel's back. The invasion of Czechoslovakia, the most flagrant violation of the Munich Agreement, caused outrage in Britain. The consensus that appeasement was now dead was instantaneous. In one swift stroke, Hitler had broken his word, repudiating the claim that the Sudetenland constituted his last territorial demand, and revealed that lust for conquest with which his critics had always charged him. There could be no further dealings with such a man, and as one Chamberlain loyalist noted in his diary, we should fight him as soon as we are strong enough. It actually took a few days for Chamberlain to change his mind. It wasn't immediate, but change his mind he did. Is this the last attack upon a small state, or is it to be followed by others? Is this, in fact, a step in the direction of an attempt to dominate the world by force? He got his answer shortly afterwards when the Romanian minister in London told the British on the 17th of March 1939 that Hitler had started demanding a monopoly on Romanian exports. This turned out to be false, but it was enough to convince Chamberlain that Hitler had to be stopped. Chamberlain started trying to create an alliance between Britain, France, the Soviet Union and Poland, but the Poles and the Soviets didn't want to work together, so Chamberlain excluded the Soviets, which of course would have disastrous effects later on down the road. On the 20th of March 1939, the British received reports that the Germans were planning on invading Poland, later confirmed on the 29th of March 1939 by another report. Therefore, Chamberlain gave his guarantee to Poland on the 31st of March 1939, stating that if the Germans went to war with Poland, Britain would join the war with her. The British guarantee to Poland contained great risk as well as considerable irony. In one fell swoop, the government had ceded the decision as to whether the country would be involved in war to a faraway country, of which they knew virtually nothing. Of course, the Polish guarantee was not designed to lead to war, but to deter Hitler from starting one. 
The problem was that Hitler doesn't seem to have realised that there had been a shift in British policy. They had given in before and they would give in again, he thought. From the German point of view, Chamberlain's guarantee lacked credibility on a number of grounds. How, to begin with, was Britain actually going to come to the aid of Poland if war really did break out? How could the geographical and logistical problems be overcome? The vagueness of the guarantee and Chamberlain's continued equivocations only served to reinforce these questions. Above all, the experience of the previous year, from the Rhineland to Austria to the Munich Agreement, had implanted in Hitler's mind the firm conviction that Britain and France would shy away from taking action. Their leaders were spineless non-entities, he thought. But they wouldn't give in. The British were now backed into a corner, having guaranteed Poland, and with Chamberlain now determined to stop Hitler from dominating Europe. It also seems that Hitler decided to offset the British threat by signing an all-but alliance with the Soviet Union. The Nazi-Soviet pact came as a complete bombshell to the Western powers. Hitler had his doubts, though, and so, on the 25th of August 1939, he told Britain that he would guarantee the British Empire and place the German military at her disposal, but only if Britain allowed Germany to claim her limited colonial demands. Britain wasn't interested, although they were still looking for ways to avoid a war. And that same day, Hitler was told that France was standing firm and would fight if Poland was attacked. So he delayed the invasion until September 1st. There were some last-minute negotiations, but Hitler was unwilling to deal with the Poles any longer, and the British weren't willing to back down to him either, or from their promise to the Poles. And so, when Hitler invaded Poland, expecting the British not to intervene, he was shocked to hear the British declaration of war. With a savage look as though implying that his foreign minister had misled him about England's probable reaction, he demanded, what now? About an hour after Hitler asked this question, Chamberlain gave his speech. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet I cannot believe that there is anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honourable settlement between Germany and Poland. But Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland, whatever happened. It's worth noting that the Nazi narrative says that the British were eager for war. The secret British shift to a war policy in October 1938, when Halifax took over control of British foreign policy from Chamberlain, was followed by the public proclamation of this new policy by Chamberlain himself at Birmingham on March 17, 1939. This culminated in turn in the launching of a new crusade against Germany on September 3, 1939. I mean, this is so far from the mark it may as well be classed as fiction. It is a complete twist of the narrative. Hitler had crusaded against Austria, Czechoslovakia, and then Poland. Chamberlain had tried appeasing him at first, and when that policy had clearly failed to satisfy Hitler's lust for Eastern conquest, he then stood firm. 
Hitler, who was the head of a country on the verge of financial ruin due to his socialist policies, was eager to gain new territories before the Reich suffered a major internal crisis. This is why he stole off the Jews. This is why he pressed on in late August and September 1939, despite indications that the British and French were standing firm. He had no other choice. Rather than it being Britain mounting a crusade against Germany, it was Hitler needing to expand at all costs due to the corner Hitler's economic socialism had painted him into. This is what the Nazi narrative cannot admit, because that would be admitting that national socialism doesn't work, unless you conquer foreign territories or steal off the Jews. Mr. Hogan is unable to admit this, and so he has to completely turn the narrative on its head and ignore a ton of evidence that refutes his own argument. So, to summarise and answer some of the minor points of the original question, Hitler had to go to war because of the economic crisis he had created for himself. It was now or never. And due to the events prior to March 1939, Hitler had become convinced that Britain wouldn't intervene over Poland. So he gambled and lost the bet. That's the reason why Hitler dared to invade Poland and end up in a war with Britain, because he didn't think he would end up in a war with Britain over Poland. Musk said that Hitler should have stopped after Czechoslovakia. No, he couldn't stop. If he had stopped his regime would have collapsed in on itself. Socialism only works until you run out of other people's money. Musk suggested that Hitler may have been mentally ill to have attacked Poland. No, he misjudged the situation. Now, was that because he was misinformed? Maybe. But the bottom line is that he misjudged the situation. Also, Musk said he wasn't prepared for war and didn't have a full war economy. True, but... He still had to go to war because he needed the resources before his economy imploded. Danzig is just the excuse. The treatment of the Germans in Poland is just the excuse. Hitler needed to expand, and he needed to expand now. And that's why he invaded Poland. So I hope that satisfies your question. I'm glad I got a chance to speak a bit more about the German economy and the lead up to the war. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of debate in the comments below over this. So I look forward to see in the comments. Thanks for watching guys, bye for now.